Hello, I'm Jocelyn Paul. Thank you so much for signing up for our 2021 Literary Lecture Series and for supporting the Heliconian Arts Club. Our first writer is Katie Miller. Late Breaking is Katie Miller's latest book of short stories and is inspired by the paintings of Alex Colville. The individual stories are held together by the characters who long to open their hearts and speak freely. And for many of us, the stories confirm that old age does not render one passionless and voiceless and powerless, or impervious to heartbreak and loneliness and despair. But Katie Miller's humor permeates the stories and reminds us not to take ourselves too seriously. Katie Miller began writing seriously in 1970 and published her first story in 1981. It won Flair's Magazine's Literary Award. Her first book of short stories, A Litany in the Time of Plague, was published in 1994. She likes the short story form with its muscular prose and the challenge of encapsulating the life of a character in one paragraph. As a young writer, K.D. was intrigued with A Bird in the House by Mar Margaret Willorance, in which one character appears in a minor role in a story, only to have a central role in a later story. She admires Alice Munro, whose vibrant descriptions of what is right in front of her emphasize the complexity of the everyday life of her characters. Her second collection, Give Me Your Answer, in 1999, was followed by The Other Voice in 2011, and All Saints in 2014. All Saints was a finalist for the 2014 Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and Late Breaking was nominated for the Scotia Giller, the Governor General's Prize, and the 2019 Trillium Book Award. Reviewer Kathy Shadle is disappointed that Miller has not been more widely celebrated and recognized. Like Colville's paintings or the stories of Alice Munro, her writing provokes questions. She invites us to think about her characters, speculate as to their motivations and their actions, and without offering tidy or pat conclusions. Katie volunteers for the CNIB as a reader. She learned that the best prose is characterized by the ease in which it comes out of the mouth. And even if the sentences are long, they're exquisitely balanced. Katie recently retired after 35 years, but she has not deviated from her daily writing practice. The decision to write first thing in the morning was made for her decades ago, when she read Mavis Gallant's The Ice Wagon Going Down the Street. And in the story, a young woman who grew up in a large family confesses that she always used to rise before dawn she felt alone in the universe and believed that she was privy to everything that can happen. Katie's writing space is her sunroom, which measures 40 square feet. The room contains two desks. The one facing the window is for writing by hand. The other holds her laptop and printer. Three filing cabinets, three sets of shelves, two lamps, and a storage trunk round out the room's contents. To quote Miss Miller, I take some pride in this Russian doll compactness. It's a tangible reminder for me of what good writing does, namely the most amount of work in the least amount of space on the page. A silhouette of a raven is perched on a Celtic cross, a highly intelligent creature that she tries to incorporate into each of her stories. Jude, her favorite saint, gazes down at her from a tiny corner bracket. She admits to belonging to the staring out of the window school of writers. And from 14 floors up, she gazes down at dog walkers, joggers, briefcase clutchers, and school children weighed down by their massive backpacks. Each morning when she sits down to write, she looks forward to connecting with her characters. She learned a long time ago that it is best to set characters free, 
and then follow them around to see what they're going to do next. She wants to be open to any surprises her characters may have in store for her. Her characters suffer from sadness and despair, but they deal with these with quiet resiliency and dignity, which does not fade away with old age. And that is why the characters in Late Breaking have stayed with me and why I have returned to read their stories. Please welcome Katie Miller. Hi, I'm Katie Miller, and I would like to thank the Heliconian Club for inviting me to be part of this series. I especially want to thank Donna Wooten for recommending me to be part of this series. I'm going to be talking to you about the influence that Alex Colville had on my latest book of linked short stories, Late Breaking, which came out in 2018 and was published by Biblioasis. That book had its genesis in 2014 when I went to the AGO for the Alex Colville exhibit. Um, I knew that I liked Alex Colville, but I didn't really know why until I saw that exhibit because there were all these marvelous lateral links to things like the works of Alice Munro and the films of the Coen brothers. Um, and I remember standing in one of those big rooms surrounded by those paintings. I was between books, I was kind of at loose ends, didn't know what I was going to do next. And the phrase, the Colville stories, came into my mind. It was just like being bonked on the head. And I, I, the Colville stories, and suddenly I knew I had my next book. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew that I could pull stories out of the, those marvelous paintings. And so four years later, in 2018, Biblioasis published Late Breaking. You'll notice there's a Colville uh, painting on the cover, and they did a marvelous thing. Uh, each story is preceded by a black and white reproduction of the relevant painting by Alex Colville. Now, I found that not everyone is really familiar with the works of Alex Colville, uh, or they're not familiar with the name. And so I found that if I would said to people, well, have you ever seen a painting of a black horse galloping towards an oncoming train? They go, oh, that guy. And that is, of course, his iconic painting. And what's interesting about that painting is that it comes from a work of literature. It was inspired by two lines of a poem, Dedication to Mary Campbell, by the American poet Roy Campbell. And those two lines are, Against a regiment, I oppose a brain, and a dark horse against an armored train. And that gave rise to the painting. Now, Alex Colville was born in Toronto in 1920. He grew up in the Maritimes. From 1938 to 1942, he studied art at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. In 1942, he married his high school sweetheart, Rhoda Wright. They were married for 70 years. He enlisted in the Canadian Army to be a war artist. He saw England, the south of France, Holland, and Germany, and he witnessed the liberation of Bergen-Belsen death camp, and his sketches of that were quite haunting at the AGO. From 1946 to 1973, he taught art at Mount Allison University. Then he moved with his family to Wolfville, Nova Scotia. He had many honors in his life. He designed the Canadian Centennial Coins. He was named Officer of the Order of Canada, Chancellor of Acadia University, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, and Companion of the Order of Canada. In 2012, his beloved Rhoda died, and in 2013, he followed her. Again, Alex Colville had tremendous influence on my latest book. And uh, a few years ago, I was addressing a university class, and I heard myself say, independence is an illusion. That had been rattling around in my brain for a while, but I'd never actually said it aloud. I had just finished listing the essentials of the writing life for this class, uh, dedicated time hard work, a little luck, and a lot of help from your friends. Uh, regarding the latter, friends, I suggested mentors, teachers, writing groups, the usual suspects. Later, though, it occurred to me that 
by friends, um, I could mean anyone, uh, including any artist or author, living or dead, whose work had inspired and shaped one's own. So on the bulletin board above my desk, I've got a yellowing bit of paper with a quote on it. Be regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. And I'd had that up before I saw the Colville exhibit, but uh, given what I've read about the man, um, whose first priorities were his home and his family, who painted in a suit and tie, and who took his own international fame with a huge grain of salt, uh, I can't help wondering if that quote by Flaubert, if that advice rang true for him too, because his paintings, uh, for which his children, his pets, and his wife, Rhoda, posed most often, are nothing if not violent and original. Between 2014 and 2017, those paintings gave me stories in which elders are menaced by hostile youth, a father confronted by pure evil barters his creativity for his daughter's innocence. A young woman is murdered by her drunken lover. And a man who cannot relate to people becomes enamored of an octopus. Yes, really. Don't worry about that, though. <laughs> Nothing happens. Um, shortly before submitting the final manuscript to Biblioasis, I entered this in my journal. I wrote... The most satisfying writing experience of my life remains the last few months of finishing late breaking. That was a very wistful acknowledgement on my part because I was already missing the community of characters that had dominated my imaginary life for three years. And that community had indeed formed organically and almost without my volition. Uh, for example, I was well into writing the title story, Late Breaking, when it came to me that its protagonist, Jill Macklin, was the longtime friend of Harriet, whose point of view directs the story Witness. Uh, this was not the first time that a character had surprised me by becoming something or doing something that I had not planned. Very early on, I learned that the people I create are not puppets on a string that I should respect their autonomy and listen up when they seem to be trying to tell me something. And Jill was telling me that she and Harriet from this other story had a shared history. Now, I had met Harriet through Woman on Ramp, a painting I kept coming back to at the AGO exhibit. It was painted in 2007. And it's an unusual work for Alex Colville. It's relatively small and it's rather quiet. A white-haired woman in a striped bathing suit is walking barefoot up a wooden ramp from a dock. Uh, her face and body are depicted with the honesty and tenderness that characterize Colville's later pro portraits of his wife, Rhoda. But there's no sentimentality in the portrayal. In fact, as I looked at this painting, I began to get afraid for this exposed, solitary old woman. What was she walking toward? What might be waiting for her inside the cottage at the top of the ramp? As soon as Harriet's in, the second she hears the screen door bang shut behind her, she feels an arm come round her neck. So begins the story, Witness the first of the Colville stories to be completed. Now, Harriet does survive the break-in, and she takes a very creative bit of revenge on her attacker. Uh, in the course of the story, through her memories and her musings, we meet her son, Ranald, uh, her son-in-law, Patrick, and her long-dead husband, Halver. Uh, nowhere, however, is there any mention of her old friend, Jill Macklin, because I hadn't met Jill yet. And when I did... I found Jill in a very strange conundrum. She was recovering from having just been dumped by her lover, and at the same time, she was getting this weird star treatment because she was nominated for the ridiculously bloated Olympia Featherstone Award for Fiction. So this combined bruising and buffing of her ego has her questioning the meaning of just about everything. And this is from the story Late Breaking. 
Jill cannot imagine suddenly having $500,000. She can't even understand what it would be for. Payment for having written late breaking? How could she be paid for such a thing? By the page? By the word? Maybe something karmic is going on and she's being feted and fed and treated like royalty now because the universe wants to apologize to her for putting her through hell last year. But how could money, even $500,000, possibly pay for a broken heart? And if it is a case of poetic justice, why did she have to break her heart in the first place? Now, in that story, to provide Jill with a little bit of emotional ballast, I invited uh, Harriet from Witness to come in and do a little cameo. They have a scene together. And in return, Harriet got me asking some questions. How did she and Jill meet? How long have they known each other? What binds them together? And why did I have the nagging feeling that there was a third party involved? Well, the only way to find out was by writing another story that let the two of them share the stage. So this excerpt is from the story, Flesh. Do you ever think about Morgan? Harriet asks Jill on the third night of her visit. They are draining a bottle of Pinot Grigio and picking the last fluffy bits out of a bowl of popcorn, having just watched their favorite DVD, Stand By Me. I do think about Morgan. Sometimes, Jill says now in answer to her question, but I still can't write about her. Jill has published seven books. Harriet goes to her launches and readings as often as she comes to Harriet's gallery shows. Could you paint her? I've sometimes tried to paint the pond from memory. Then, do you ever wonder what we all would have been like if Morgan... Yeah, I do but I can't imagine it. Harriet can. She is convinced that neither she nor Jill would have accomplished anything much. Instead, they would have followed Morgan's career in the papers, shown up for her concerts whenever she touched down in Toronto, made awkward small talk with each other during the intermissions. So one link, one acquaintance led to another And in hindsight, it kind of looks schematic and deliberate, but again, it was not planned, uh, at least not consciously planned. Um, In fact, I was wrapping up one of the final stories before it occurred to me that Grace Morgan Pettengill, the Morgan just referred to, who is in fact dead before the book begins, is the collection's common denominator. I hadn't been conscious of that, but then I realized that one way or another, uh, as a memory, as a series of diary entries, a dream, a ghost, she touches base with every other character in the, in the book. Now, I sense that Morgan would have entered Harriet's and Jill's lives early on, uh, when all three were on the threshold of adulthood. So I decided that they met in their late teens as disgruntled camp counselors and then pledged to spend every Labor Day weekend together at the Pattengill summer house on the shores of Lost Lake in the, in the Laurentians. And again, this is from the story Flesh. Jill was still asleep upstairs. Harriet had come down to the kitchen to get coffee and had heard Morgan half humming, half singing one of the hymns that, along with old Beatles and Beach Boys tunes, formed her personal hit parade. And did those feet in ancient times, and was the Holy Lamb of God among those dark satanic mills? It was right then that Harriet knew she was in love with Morgan. As strange as that was, it made sense. Did Morgan know how she felt? Harriet both did and did not want her to, nor could she imagine telling her. What could she say? She could barely describe her feelings to herself. It wasn't as if she wanted to make love to Morgan. A young 19, she was still slightly vague in her mind about how she would do that with a man, let alone a woman. It was more that she wanted to follow Morgan through life, worship her, be known by her, seen by her. Yes, be the one, the apple of Morgan's eye. Okay, back to Alex Colville, because in the works of Alex Colville, you find similar connections, uh, recurrences. Uh, I'm intrigued, for example, by the way certain figures and images haunt his paintings. 
solitary walkers, lone swimmers, oncoming trains, turned backs and out of frame heads, faces either sharply averted or challenging the viewer with a direct gaze, handguns held at the ready or suspended in air as if having just been dropped, nude bodies subjected at times to cruel lighting that emphasizes their vulnerability. And then there's what I've come to think of as the Colville moment, because you always get the feeling when you look at a Colville painting that something either has just happened or is just about to happen. And it leaves the viewer with unanswerable questions. Will the galloping horse veer off the tracks in time or smash headlong into the speeding train? Is the just dropped handgun a repudiation of suicide or perhaps murder? How long will the robed, headless figure in the background wait for the hunched woman to emerge from the bathtub? How long will she endure the chilling water to avoid him? If that is, in fact, what's going on. Because every viewer, of course, will perceive a different kind of ambiguity, different shades of ambiguity. And, and it was just this openness to interpretation that inspired me to pull stories out of those paintings in the first place. Now, that pulling took various forms. Uh, at no time did I attempt schoolgirl fashion to describe what's happening in the picture. I didn't do that. Though I did occasionally stay very close to the subject matter and savor its details. For example, Refrigerator, painted in 1977, uh, gave rise to this paragraph in the story, Ollie Ollie Oxen Free. She was living in a communal house full of girls and cats. The first night Leo stayed over, they sneaked naked together out to the kitchen for a midnight snack. In the white light of the opened fridge, as Leo drank Fiona's share and more of the milk, the cats came and twined around their legs. Similarly, the story Crooked Little House contains a passage whose visual counterpart is Dog, Boy, and St. John River, painted in 1958. And there's this from Crooked Little House. His dog sister now inhabits his boyhood memories. She's there with him those mornings he was, what, 14? Heading down to the river, toting the air rifle, couldn't do much more with it than scare crows that his father gave him over his mother's protests. Every Saturday morning, he took his rifle down to the banks of the St. John, crouched behind a bush to watch and wait, half hoping, half fearing, to see the swastika deckled turret of a submarine breaking the surface. And now, when he thinks of those mornings, sister is by his side taking her cue from him, watching the water. And similarly, this painting, Cyclist and Crow, done in 1981, uh, gave rise to this passage from the story In the Crow's Keeping. This is part of Morgan Pettingill's diary. I was pedaling along a path beside the meadow. All at once, a crow was flying right beside me. He was following me or racing me. Anyway, we were together, communing with each other. I did a foolish thing, but it felt so necessary. For the longest time, until it flew up and away into a tree, I took my eyes off the path and fixed them on the crow. I did not look where I was going. I trusted the crow to guide me. I gave myself to the crow. I put my life in the crow's keeping. Most often, uh, I didn't stick that close to the material of the paintings. Most often, what I took from a painting was something by way of a mood, you know, a chill down the spine, or maybe a question, an image that snagged and wouldn't let go. Um, sometimes, I would look at a painting, and again, a question would form in my own mind. One example of that is this painting, Kiss with Honda, done in 1989. And um, this is, in fact, the Colvilles. Uh, this is one of the very many times that Colville put himself and his wife, Rhoda, right into the painting. And I think we have a tendency to look at this painting and think that it, there's something very sweet about it, you know, this, this older couple, and they're still affectionate. 
Well, I looked at it and I went, wait a minute. What if I just happen to be the partner of one of these people and I come across this scene? Suddenly it's not so sweet. So this was the genesis of the story, The Last Trumpet, about a man who never told his late wife that he knew that she had cheated on him. And suddenly, long after her death, his anger is coming up. The painting January, done in 1971, gave rise to the title story, but has, in fact, no literal counterpart in it. Um, the image of a couple snowshoeing, the man is grimly facing forward, almost masked, and the woman is stopped in her tracks and almost painfully twisting to look back the way she's come. Th that cold tension between the two um, told me something about the characters Elliot Som Summers and Jill Macklin in the title story, Late Breaking. And also the painting, Mr. Wood in April, uh, done in 1960. Uh, there was something about the isolation and the vulnerability from that lone figure that became the seed of the story Octopus Heart, in which Elliot, who has treated Jill very badly, has a chance to explain and perhaps redeem himself. And this is from Octopus Heart. He watched himself withdrawing, becoming cold and critical. He wanted to stop, wanted to put his kind and caring mask back on to see that girlish joy come back into Jill's face. He would wake up in the dark hours appalled at what he was doing to her, go back to sleep vowing to apologize and tell her the truth the next day. But then, awake in the light, he would feel that cold unwillingness grip him again. After all, what could he tell her? I haven't seen my daughter in years because she hates me. My wife is in an institution. She sits in a diaper all day, staring out a window. Her expression only changes when she turns and sees that it's me again. That man she doesn't know, but manages to despise. So he would convince himself Jill was to blame for being so damn nosy. Then take a perverse pleasure in listening to her voicemails, reading her emails, pressing erase pressing delete. The paintings, in fact, uh, did not always come first in the process. When I was really immersed in the collection, uh, I was equally immersed in the paintings, and sometimes I wrote a story and then went looking for its visual parallel. For example, Three Girls on a Wharf, painted in 1953. I finished the story Flesh, and then went looking and settled on Three Girls on a Wharf as its companion piece. The sensuality of the figures, all in the process of stripping bare, uh, catches the latent sexual tension between the youthful Jill, Harriet, and Morgan. And the close overlapping of their bodies foresees the bond that will survive the death of one of them and continue to embrace the other two as they enter old age. Which brings me to old age and the depiction of age. Age and the way it works on the body and the mind is one of Late Breaking's thematic links. I wrote in, on May 23rd, 2016, I wrote this in my journal. Sometimes I have the odd feeling that I've been waiting all my life to be this age. Now, I would have been just months from finishing the book. It's not so much a case of all passion spent as all passion known. At 65, you can choose your passion. Base your choice on knowledge and experience. Now, Alex Colville, again, never flinched from portraying the realities of getting older. And th there's something courageous about that, and this courage is hard won, because when we reach a certain age, we have to start fighting to de defend the turf that we have occupied all our lives. And one of the worst forms that ageism can take, and I know that I was very guilty of this when I was younger, is the assumption that older people's feelings have atrophied, that such things as longing and joy and lust and heartbreak are beyond them. This is not true. 
Most of the characters in Late Breaking are in fact in their third age. They take risks, they make plans, they make love. They cherish their lives as much as they ever did. So on their behalf, I take a little bit of uh, gleeful revenge on our youth-obsessed society in one scene of the final story, In the Crow's Keeping, featuring 90-year-old Clarissa Pattengill, mother of Morgan. Clarissa feels at loose ends. That restlessness, the nagging conviction that there is something she should be doing, some project she should take on, her age notwithstanding, will not let her alone. On a whim, as a distraction, she takes herself out to dinner. She can still do that once a month or so, as her wallet and digestion allow. In the rendezvous, she is led to a dark table near the washrooms. Why are you putting me here? She asks the young hostess. I'd rather sit near the window. The place is not even half full. Oh, well, I thought the girl is flustered. Clarissa, leaning on her walker, does not blink. The girl stumbles on. I thought this would be maybe more comfortable for you. I walked two blocks to get here. I am capable of crossing a room should the need arise. She gets her window seat, studies the menu. When the waiter arrives, he says, and what can I get for you, young lady? I beg your pardon. He leans down, speaks louder and more slowly. I said what I heard you the first time. I was giving you a chance to redeem yourself. Then, into the young man's blank-faced confusion, she says, I am neither young nor a lady. You may address me as ma'am, and you may bring me a martini. Gin, dry, straight up, twist. Of course, the effects of aging on our faces and faculties scare us because they remind us and they remind everyone we meet, whether in the mirror or on the sidewalk, of the thing that we really fear. And there's a lot of death in late breaking, everything from murder and suicide to the putting down of an old dog. Uh, death is an implied presence, too, throughout the works of Alex Colville. I would say, no matter how lighthearted and innocent any of his paintings appear to be, you'll find death in it somewhere, the implication of death. It's even beneath the surface innocence of child skipping, one of the paintings that spoke to the story Lost Lake. This was painted in 1958. The child is suspended mid-jump. A summer breeze is lifting her skirt and hair. But if you look at her surroundings, they're quite harsh. Hard cement, gravelly dirt, a blank sky sliced by the sharp right angles of buildings. The very isolation of the childish figure all but be begs, in fact, for some menacing presence to be watching her from behind one of those hard-edged corners. Menacing, evil, you might say, and evil is not a word that I use often. I struggle to believe in the thing in itself, whether as a natural or a supernatural phenomenon. Um, I have to say, though, that something crept into two stories in late breaking, for which I can find no other word. The stories Oli Oli Oxen Free and Lost Lake both contain cameos by a character whose reality is in question, even in my own mind. I don't know who he is, what he is, whether he's real, whether he's a ghost, whether he's someone's hallucination. Uh, outwardly, he resembles the kind of genial country gent in tweeds, flat cap, and brogues that, brogues that you might chat with about the weather. But if, as some have suggested, evil is the absence of good, uh, he's more like a black hole. And he walked into these two stories. I wasn't expecting him, but there he was. And I recognized him. And I couldn't wish him away. Sometimes when studying the paintings of Alex Colville, I felt a similar shudder of recognition. There's something there, and it's very bad news. You don't know what it is. That said, if something resemble, resembling evil lurks through the artist's work, uh, his portrayal of animals acts as a counterbalance to it. 
Colville regarded animals as essentially innocent, incapable of evil or malice, unless they are conditioned to such state by human actions. And this painting is French Cross, painted in 1988. The dogs, cats, horses, ravens, and other creatures that appear in the paintings inspired my own creation of the non-humans in late breaking. I really tried to embed a raven in every story, and I almost succeeded. Uh, in The Last Trumpet and Crooked Little House, Sister the Beagle provides widower Lynn Sparks with company and comfort. An Appaloosa horse named Frank awakens Marion to a latent desire to ride and to seek more control over her life. In the story, Higgs Boson. And again, in Octopus Heart, Cephalopod Ella all but reaches out a tentacle to touch Elliot in his isolation. And this is from Octopus Heart. Elliot discovers Ella at the aquarium in Toronto and he keeps visiting her. He knows it's crazy, but whenever he lets Ella look at him, his muscles relax in a way they haven't in longer than he could remember. He feels as if Ella is seeing through him, into the space inside him, that she knows exactly what it's like to be Elliot Summers. What's it like to be you? He wonders back at her. Is your life as simple as it looks? Do you have family that you miss? What about mating? Is there any pleasure in it for you, or just pressure and release? Are you lonely in that tank, all by yourself? Now, I've been talking about how things kind of grew organically, how I walked around behind characters and saw what they were going to do. I don't want to give the impression that, you know, late breaking was the product of a tranced automatic writing or anything like that. Um, once I settled on producing a collection of linked stories, I was quite deliberate at a certain point about working in details that would enhance their connectivity. Uh, settings, for example, are shared. The cities of Hamilton, Toronto, and Sackville each host more than one story as do the shores of Lost Lake in the Laurentians. Uh, five of my characters find themselves inside the Melville Staines funeral home for one reason or another, and just about everybody at some point orders a meal at the Rendezvous restaurant. I managed to create a Toronto in which there is one restaurant, the Rendezvous, and they all show up there. Uh, in the story Flesh, when Harriet and her son Ranald are having lunch, they overhear two men at an adjacent table Elliot and Bill from Octopus Heart talking about going to the aquarium. And when Elliot gets too close to a class of grade threes touring that facility, the teacher who gives him a warning look is Patrick, husband of Ranald, son-in-law of Harriet. So if this sounds like fun, linking these things up, it really, really is. Um, at time of writing, I still miss the people and the animals that I came to know as a result of writing Late Breaking. They influenced and shaped me as surely as I did them, and we were all tremendously influenced by Alex Colville. I really wish I could thank him, and I thank you. <laughs>